Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, feel good about driving. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 340 for July 29th of 2016. Choosing cars that could become classics. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Well, welcome everybody to AutoLine After Hours. My co-host Gary Vaslash is out on vacation right now, but I got two of my colleagues joining me today. Todd Lassa with Automobile Magazine. Great having you here, Todd. John, great to be here as always. And Chris Pockert, Roadshow by CNET is what he's doing these days. And Chris, great having you here as well. Good to be back. Thank you. And of course, one of the reasons I wanted these two guys here is we've got uh, a special guest today, Ray Arandowski. I hope I said that right, Ray. Close enough. He's Close really enough. Good. <laughs> <laughs> who's also brought in his 1971 Cadillac Eldorado. And we're kind of doing that this, uh, bringing the car into the studio right now because the Concours d'Elegance at St. John's here in the Detroit area is this weekend. And mm-hmm. this car is going to be there, right, Ray? Yes, it is, for the first time. For the first time, what do you mean? You've been uh, trying to get it into the I've show? I've been trying to get it in. It was one of those things that uh, my father always wanted it in. Uh, I've been trying, and finally this year it, uh, it's going to make its mark. How do you go about doing that? I, I mean, I know you've got to be invited, right? They, you can't just drive up and say, hey, put my car in the show. Nope. You have to be uh, qualified for a class that, may, uh, uh, that they may have, and uh, they don't always have that kind of a class. Uh, but this is an uh, uh, American por- post-war, um, late so it fit right into the category. What did they like about this car? Why did they say, yeah, we need that Eldo in this, in this show? I don't know, but when you find out, you tell yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the king of the hill. I started reading Motor Trend, which was my employer before automobile, of course, uh, back in 1970 or so, 1970s, early 1970s. Um, it started a regular comparison called King of the Hill. And uh, I... Th- I think the first one I read was maybe a, the previous year, the 70 Eldorado, which was uh, redone. The car, this is all new for 1971, all new body, um, all new design and so on, uh, with the carryover 500 cubic inch V8. And uh, Motor Trend would compare that with the Lincoln Mark III and then later Mark IV uh, every few years or so. And I think they kind of traded back and forth between which one they decided was King of the Hill, kind of depending on which was newest. So I'm pretty sure the 71 Eldorado was King of the Hill. It's a wild car. And, you know, you mentioned 500 inch cub- a cubic inch V8, but it also says 8.2 liters on a uh, little badge on the, the front fender there. I wonder, is that the first time a metric designation was used on a U.S. car? I hate to sound like Jim Hall, but no. Uh, <laughs> Jim Hall, the man who knows everything. Yes. Uh, a you remember the encyclopedia. You remember the 1966 Ford Galaxy 500 XL, the sporty one? I know the car you're talking about. They did list, they, they had a seven liter badge on that. It mm-hmm. came, it was 427 cubic, cubic inches, so they didn't have, they could round to seven liters, which mm-hmm. is basically what that is. And that had a seven liter badge, and, and I'm, I couldn't, tell you for certain that that was the first American car, but uh, it had been done before. So you mentioned this this was your father's car. Can you tell us a little bit about the backstory and why it's important to you? Well, uh, my father had bought and sold uh, many Cadillacs uh, throughout my whole childhood, even in the grown uh, grown adulthood, Um, and he'd always find them. I'd always clean them, and he would join and do the same, Uh, and then he would sell them. And this was the very first car that he ever kept for more than a couple of years. Um, I did repaint it. Uh, it was, it's an original 12,000-mile car. Um, it's still the original top interior in chrome, uh, but it was pale yellow. Uh, we went through some problems, but I ended up tearing the whole car apart and repainting it in black. Um, and I don't know if it's because I did it or maybe he just really liked it because it was triple black and he ended up keeping it. 
So it was one of the very first cars that he kept for a number of years. Uh, and then him, him passing a couple of years ago, getting to the Concours was one of his bucket list pieces. So I knew I had to get it in. So when you say triple black, what do you mean? Black top, black leather interior, and black exterior. And, and black top, of course, because this is a, a vinyl top a vinyl car. Top, you can only yeah. get it in vinyl top. Yeah. What's special, I mean, other than your dad having bought the car and you repaint it, what is it about this car that really sets it off for you? I think because it's such a, a cut line uh, vehicle, it looks like something that was just cut out of the clay and right into production without modifying it or, or changing things or, uh, or going to somebody else's idea. I think it's the cleanest and, and sexiest Cadillac that's been built. And it's big, too. This is uh, 19 feet long, Yep, which is about two feet longer than a current-day Escalade. Just to give an idea, right? And it's a two-door. I mean, this is really coupe, a coupe, yeah. and I, I just love the fact that <laughs> we used to make two-door cars that were 19 feet long. Yeah. But you don't feel like it. You could sit in this and not feel like it's an overwhelming-sized car. I mean, you can get into a Duesenberg and be like, "Oh my gosh, this is. When does it end?" But this, I don't feel like that. I feel like it's uh, up close and personal. What I what I love about this era car is the width inside. And, you know, the, the flat seats just emphasize the width and the, the expanse of the dashboard. But what's interesting to me, I took a quick poke around your car, is it's got an almost cockpit-style layout with the radio canted toward the driver and all of that instead of just a, a flat expanse, so it right. makes it a little bit more intimate. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a nice piece of design. What I like about the proportions on it is, number one, its length. The hood is gigantic. And, but the other thing that really catches my eye is the juxtaposition of the rear wheel to... Uh, the sail panel from the roof. And that, that's a, a very general motors look where when they design a coupe, they move the rear wheel back just behind where the roof line drops yeah. because it gives the car a, a, a muscular, almost athletic look. So even though this is, you know, the classic American barge mobile, it's got an athletic look to it as well. Right. This was the second generation, by the way, of the of the original front wheel drive Eldorado. The first one was 67, 68, 69, and then, uh, I'm sorry, 68, 69, and 70, 67 through 70, and then this one would, would have been the second generation. And I don't remember, did, I think the 71 was also the first convertible front drive Eldorado. Wasn't yes. It? And, and that became... For a while, the last convertible Cadillac, uh, production Cadillac, uh, 76 was the last model there. And to your point, I mean, they, they had to start adding plastic, uh, five mile per hour bumpers. Right. Of course, we had the uh, great uh, smog choking of the engines. So <laughs> that 500 cubic inches did not put out a great deal of uh, net horsepower. Uh, Pretty enormous amount of gas. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you measure fuel mileage? Uh, no, but I tell you, if I get on the gas, I know it by the time I get home. So uh -huh. it's, uh, it's pretty extreme. But it doesn't do too bad if you're just at uh, regulated speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not too bad at all. Sure. Sure. And, you know, that's a great point about the bumpers because these are nicely tucked in mm -hmm. to the body. It was, what, just a year or two later where they had the big guardrails of bumpers sticking mm -hmm. out on the yeah. end of it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep, they were huge in the front. And uh, interesting, uh, the uh, layout, maybe you can describe this better than me, John, but the, uh, uh, it's a front-wheel drive car, and yet it's a longitudinal engine, and I think the, the transmission is somehow juxtaposed sideways or off to the side and back. Uh, which is unusual, obviously. Front drive cars are almost, almost always transverse engines. Mm. So you have that rear wheel drive dash to axle proportion in that car. Uh, which, That's interesting. I, yeah. thought, I thought that was just a design decision, but I, I was wondering about that because it is, it is huge. Yes. No, it's it, a longitudinal engine, as was the old Tornado of that era. Yeah, no, it, it does not look like a front wheel drive car no, at yeah. all. Yeah. But part of it goes back to that 19 feet of length. Yeah. And, and I don't know, what's the hood? Uh, six feet? It's just over, <laughs> six I think feet it's just over six and a half feet. Six and a half <laughs> feet long. So when it's you, wider than it is length. Is that right? It's almost seven, it's almost seven. <laughs> well, I think it, no, I think it actually is longer, but it's almost equal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Enormous. So, 
The point being is, you know, to your point, it's a longitudinal engine, and they, they have this convoluted way of getting the automatic transmission packaged in there. Right. But they've got so much room, they can just shove it out there, and so you That's still get true. that dash-to-axle ratio. Today, we'd never do that. I mean, just look at the overhang in the front alone. Yeah. It, what's yeah. that? It's got to be two feet just about. And, uh, but it looks no. proportional. It looks well, very nice because no, but, the whole package is so long. But right. you're right. You'd and never do it now. In those days, you could do stuff. You could go, oh, you know, the proportions aren't right. Stretch it out another six inches yeah. there. Today, you can't do that. I mean, from a cost, from a mass, from a crash, all that stuff, you know. So th this is still of the era when you could pretty much get away with what you wanted to do design-wise. Mm. That's why I think from my, my f personal favorite era is, is the 30s. I, I really think the streamlining was phenomenal in the 30s, mid-30s. And to me, it lost it for a very long time. And to me, this is a very, one of the very first that has that streamline effect uh, for a car of the 70s. Nobody else had it, and nobody else could pull it off this clean. You're right. Well, actually, I, I think if you looked at uh, a 71 Buick Riviera, it would have... It doesn't look like this car whatsoever, but it's it's got, especially at the back end, more of a, a boat tail. Yeah, it's, it's got, it's got the, it, that was the sporty of the of those cars. Uh, oh, there we got a picture you, of you mentioned that car because yep. they all had the basic underpinnings: the Cadillac Eldorado, the Buick Riviera, and the Oldsmobile um, Tornado. And yet, the Buick Riviera was rear-wheel drive. The Tornado and, and the, the Eldorado were, were front-wheel drive. And they they shared some. Uh, the uh, the under uh, underpinnings underpinnings I guess yeah, yeah well look you know this is back still when Fisher Body was going strong and and those guys were magicians when it came to mixing and matching different kinds of panels and coming up with entirely new different kinds yeah. of cars yeah. even though in many cases not not in the case of the Eldorado here but in some of the lower price cars you know uh, Buicks and Pontiacs and Chevrolets might actually share some body parts but they were twisted around and moved in different ways. Yeah. So they saved on tooling costs, but still came up with totally different looking cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So you, what other cars are, are going to be uh, with yours on display at St. John's? I've only right? been told about two, so I'm not too sure. I, I know there's going to be a uh, 67 uh, Riviera um, in a 60, 64, I want to say which I think they're both pretty different designs. Yes, yes. Um, but they're owned by the same person. Hmm. But uh, they're, they should stand alone pretty well. Um, but those are actually the three I only know about. Yeah. So he didn't involve me in the, the overall pick. Uh -huh. so, but you must be thrilled getting this car there, too. I mean, I, 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 we I'm were ecstatic. talking before the show, and uh, you, you say you never miss the Concours. I would never miss the Concours. There's something for everybody um, in, uh, you know, anything from fashion to art to the automobile, to the motorcycles, to the sometimes bikes. It all depends on what's going on. Uh, just like the one you've seen, the, uh, the uh, Defibian. The, uh, oh, yeah, there, there was this amphibious Russian, Soviet-era yep. vehicle. I think it was an Antonov 100 or something like that that was uh, this almost James Bond-looking kind of futuristic thing that was, I guess, supposed to go pick up downed pilots if they were shot down over the tundra or ice areas. So it doesn't even have wheels. It's got this big prop on the back. I mean, it's the ultimate, you know, uh, uh, aircraft, aircraft for that's ground. A very specific usage case. That's pretty yeah. fascinating. That's, but that's one of the great things about this particular Concours is that it, it, it embraces all different types of vehicles, and a lot of it's more accessible. Um, you know, you go out to Pebble or something like that, and it's, you know, guys with $8 million Ferraris, and they're all rubbed with a diaper, and they don't yep. go anywhere. Yep. And while they're beautiful to look at, and they have amazing competition histories, they're, it's harder to relate to. Um, and, you know, a car like this, a lot of us remember seeing them growing the, up, and we have, you know, heartstrings get tugged because we knew the neighbor down the street had one, or our fathers had them. Right. Um, it's just great to see. Yeah, nothing on the 18th green at Pebble that crosses the 18th green at Pebble is driven on a regular basis. Uh, they're all trailer queens. Uh, that may be the only drive that particular car gets that year. And and at St. John's, it's um, like you, people who actually take them out and drive them. You brought it over here. How, how often do you drive it? Uh, tell us about your... Still not enough as far as I'm yeah. concerned, you know, because we, we want to make our own, our own memories. Uh, sure. And I try to get my, my kids out there and, and the 64 Fleetwood we take out and 
still, again, not as much as I would like to, uh, but we need to drive them because we need to, to show the next generation down that this is where the memories are made from. It's not just a car. It's where we're all together and, and talking about our parents or talking about where we want to go or what you want to do. So there's a lot to it more than just a vehicle. I got to believe this car gets lots of looks wherever you go. It tends to stop traffic every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a 64 Fleetwood Cadillac? Yes. Uh, and then anything else beside these two? It's as far as me, myself, uh, we have the 71 Eldorado, and then we have the 64 Fleetwood, and then my wife has a 60 Imperial. Oh, wow. So okay. soon enough, I will have that one under control. You must have a very, very big garage. <laughs> Not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> so how many miles on your 71 Eldorado? I think it turned 12.7 on the way here. 12,700 miles yes. for a 1971. That's yep. incredible. I think we bought it. It had 7,800 7, miles on it. Hmm. So not a lot of gain for the amount of time we've owned it since no, uh, no. since 98 i think is when my father bought it but i mean this thing's almost showroom quality you well, know, he like did have a carpeted garage i don't have a carpeted garage but he did <laughs> <laughs> paint aside what else have you had to do with it or is it it's, it's all original interior and the yes. top and all yep. that the motor uh, basic maintenance uh, i had some uh, brake updating last year cuz just uh, froze up and things like that but other than that it's completely underneath its own original power uh, haven't even touched the carburetor. Hmm. Just plugs wires and in an air cleaner, and we're on. Everything on the inside works? Yep, the only thing that just failed on me uh, recently was the air conditioning. It had its original wow. Freon up until just recent. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, which is truly amazing. Truly amazing. I thought you were going to say the clock. Because yeah, that's, that's the one thing that never, <laughs> that never lasts, of course, because, you know, battery. I didn't check that on the way here. Uh, but yeah. It's... <laughs> I haven't checked that, that, that you right might have me day, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> so if people get to go to St. John's, you're, you're going to be where? Do you know where it'll be located? I don't on? know what area of the show I will be in. Uh, it's it's post-war late, um, but they did not give me a field diagram yet. I'll get that. Well, post, post-war post late, yes. that, that's probably good enough yep. guidance to, to be able to find it. It's an exciting show. Uh, there truly is something for everybody along with a huge art exhibit that all the auto, automotive uh, artists uh, have their own area as well. Um, and I will never miss that area either, so. Good deal. Well, we ought to wrap this segment up here, but Ray, thanks so much for coming along. This Thank is you. Thank you guys for having me. Beautiful it's, uh, car, story. great backstory to it. And uh, of course, anybody who's listening to this now in the Detroit area can actually set their eyes on it this weekend. That'd be great. Always good for a story. Good deal. Well, look, we're going to take a, a quick uh, break right now and give a shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Well, we're back right now. Ray's left, but we still have his car in the studio. And like I said, I can't get over uh, a 19-foot-long two-door. I just love the proportions on this car. You have a remote camera? We should take it for a ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, don't tell Ray. Plenty, yeah. <laughs> plenty of room in that thing. Hey, I did a thing uh, earlier this week on Autoline Daily where I looked at four cars that I think could be future classics. And uh, what I'm saying is cars that are out there right now, you can easily buy them. They have not appreciated in value. They haven't been discovered yet, as it were. But I'm trying to figure out, okay... Here we got a 71 Eldorado that's sitting on, or going to be sitting on the lawn of a major concourse. 30 years from now, 40 years from now, what's going to be out there? So uh, I came up with uh, four cars, and I, I hope we got pictures of those, starting with uh, the Subaru SVX. Do we have that, Carmen? Yeah, we do. And uh, I'm intrigued by this car. Uh, you know, it's a Giorgetto Giugiaro design. So, you know, one of the, the all-time master designers yes. did this, this vehicle. It was uh, all-wheel drive. It had this funky window arrangement where 
only part of the glass would drop, you know, about enough to pay a parking attendant, you know, and, and not much more than that. Yeah, it and, bows out. It's got a lot of tumble home in that upper glass. Yeah. Great thing about that car is that it's a, it's the kind of halo car that only Subaru could do, and yet it's so far out of Subaru's regular wheelhouse. You know, they're they're not. They just do very straightforward um, crossover SUVs or sedans and wagons and so on, uh, with the exception of the BRZ now, of course. And and this car just really stands out. It, it couldn't be anything but a Subaru, and yet. It doesn't make sense as a Subaru, mm. and I think that may be why. You know, I don't remember what the price was back then, but I'm, I'm sure it was by far the most expensive. It was. Subaru. They were trying to move upscale, go sporty upscale, and yeah, I don't remember the price. I want to say it you're... started like in the high twenties. Wow. Uh, it was. It was. Re it, it was. Re be. It was really quite expensive. It was only sold with the V6. Only sold with an automatic. Right. Most of them were leather, um, and I think it was just it was a bridge too far, you know. But it, but now it's it's really interesting to see. Was that I, remind remind me what years was it built? Uh. What what was was that? Oh, 88, 89, something yeah, like that. Yeah, right, 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 right. 88, 89. Yeah. Yeah. Could be 90, 91. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe high 20s um, uh, back when, remember, this was also at the same time that uh, Honda put the first uh, uh, Japanese car on the market that had a price more than fifty or sixty thousand dollars, which mm -hmm. was the uh, Acura NSX. Right. Which so, the values of those are going nuts yeah. now. Yeah. And those used to be bargains. Right. And, and so that's an obvious one, right? The right. NSX. Yeah. So I'm right. trying to identify cars that I think are affordable, are mm -hmm. easily obtainable, and uh, so let's go to the next one. I, th I think uh, the Lincoln Blackwood. <laughs> you know. Oh, do we have a picture of that? I'm sure we do. There. There it go. is. And, uh, you, you know my, you know, I, I've probably told the story too often. You know my story about the one Blackwood I saw out in the wild. This is after having driven one as a press vehicle. And I was walking over to the, I, I was working downtown, walking to the Renaissance Center for a GM press conference or something. And I saw one at the uh, city courthouse, uh, the city hall rather. And um, I wondered, well, was it the lawyer, lobbyist? council person or whatever, and I saw a hot dog vendor put his hot dog cart in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, that, I will always associate the Lincoln Blackwood with, with that. hot dog vendor? And with Bruce McCall. It looks like a Bruce McCall drawn vehicle. <laughs> with a small, relatively small greenhouse, an expanse in front of you, an expanse behind you. Yeah. Well, that, the, the rear end of it, if we can bring that picture back up, was uh, a composite. And you can see those, uh, what look like, uh, chrome, thin chrome strips on it were, were inlaid into that, and it had like some sort of faux African wood, if I remember right. Like Zebrano yeah. or something, something right? Something yeah. like that. And all I remember is uh, the supplier that made it, which was Magna, had horrific quality problems with it. It was so hard to make. They probably scrapped as many as they built. Mm. And uh, so this truck was a, a complete sales flop. They only built it one model year. I think it was the yeah. 2002 yeah. model year, and then whoosh, it was gone. Well, it didn't make for a very good truck, honestly, because right. the bed was covered in stainless steel, and it, they all had the ton hard tonneau on it, and they had the funky rear, you know, tailgate. Right. And you just wouldn't want to put anything in there, and it was expensive. Other than a hot dog cart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it's interesting that it... it so uh, your other two cars are foreign, right? Before we get to them, get, not giving them away. Uh, you have an American car on the list. I do have an American okay, car on the list. Beside this, right. um, it's interesting that it for me it's hard to think of anything from the say from the mid '80s up until the early 2000s that I might consider a collectible that's also American. But um, you know, uh, it's interesting that one that you come up with is a pickup truck, which of course now is the biggest thing on, on the road in yeah. every sense of the world. And was Lincoln ahead of its time? I mean, you know, now we've got King Ranch Ford F-150s that are 50, 60 well, and, and they've bucks. tried it a few times, right? They had the Mark LT after that. Yeah. And that was more conventional. Yeah. And that's why I'd say they were not ahead of their time. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you had the Mark LT and then you also had the uh, pickup version of the Cadillac Escalade. Mm -hmm. And those didn't do well either. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that Ford and Chevrolet and GMC, which has a little bit more of a premium image, if nothing else, and, and Ram, previously Dodge, Nissan and Toyota, of course, they, they are all selling premium trucks with 
the, 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 the mainstream badge on it, the Ford badge, the Chevy badge. They're, they're just going way up market with fifty or $60,000 pickups without having to give it any other name beside the Ford and the Ram and the mm -hmm. Chevy. Do you think that's because people want to appeal, appear humble on some level when they pull onto the job site and you know, they don't necessarily want uh, you know, to be, that's my $60,000 King Ranch kind of thing? Or? No, I think they do want you they to do know that's my $60,000 King Ranch. Yeah, they do. It's the King Ran Ranch, Ranch badge combined with the Ford badge. I think it's trying to appear authentic, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not trying to appear humble, but trying to appear authentic. And it really has uh, a similar vibe as Jeep, which right. after all, you know, for many, many years were just workhorse vehicles. And now, uh, you know, that's the hottest, one of the hottest things on the road. Well, as you guys know, Mercedes is now going to experiment with yeah. pickup. Mm -hmm. yeah. My question is, do they keep that tucked away with all their other commercial vehicles, their vans and the like? Or... Or is there an opportunity here for Mercedes to get into the pickup segment as for urban cowboys, not as a work truck? Suburban cowboys. Yeah. 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 Suburban, you don't want right? to take any of these in the city. They're way no. too big. But I don't even think it'll be as big as something like an F-150, my guess is. To begin with. Right. And, and, and I don't think they've committed to selling it in the U.S. yet. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to see how they skew, right? I mean, yeah, it, it, in, yeah. Uh, yeah, over, over in Europe, obviously, they have a, a much bigger commercial arm where something like that would be far more readily accepted, you know, rubber floors and vinyl seats and all of that, even in nicer trims as well. But they, they have a whole range of, of commercial vehicles, which they're starting to get into here in the U.S. Well, remember, they have the deal with Nissan, so we expect that'll be on the Nissan. But uh, as you guys know, platform. you can make as much profit on a pickup as you can on a luxury no, car. You weigh, you way make, more. Way more. Okay, way, way more. more. Way more. Yeah. So, and remember, throughout the 1990s, the Europeans and the Japanese all laughed at the Americans and their SUVs. Now, guess what? They all got them, too. Yeah. So that's my question. Are they going to go, hey, guys, we're letting GM and Ford and Ram get, we're letting them, we're leaving too much money on the table. Yeah, I, boy, you know, if you look at how Nissan and, and Toyota have struggled in the full-size pickup truck market, Toyota might say it's not struggling because if you sell 80 or 100,000 a year, that's not a bad number. But compared with, you know, the American brands, forget it, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so what, ca it, it's still going to be a small foothold. But to your point, I think what makes, what drives this is the fact that the profit is so good that you pay off the tooling right away. I mean, it's just pure profit very early in the in the life yeah. cycle. So it it's kind of like, why wouldn't you do it? It's the same reason why you've got so many variations. So you've got these four-door coupe variations of Mercedes and BMW SUVs now. It doesn't cost them that much to do that, to switch it around. If they sell a few thousand of them, the everyone's market. pure profit. Yeah, and look, Remember when Porsche went with the Cayenne? It was horrors, horrors. A sports car company making an SUV. Now we don't bat an eye about it. So now we're well, thinking. I still bat an eye about it. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but you know but now it's weird when they don't. Almost. Yeah, you know? and so you know now we're saying horrors, horrors. A Mercedes pickup truck. Uh, maybe in a few years it's not going to be so unusual. So then the question is, can the Bentley pickup truck be far behind? <laughs> <laughs> There'll be some ambitious customizer that just chops the back off the Bentayga and could be. extends it out a little bit. Hey, look, we got more cla potential classic cars to go through, more stuff to talk about with pickups, but we got to take a quick commercial break here. So, Carmen, let's give a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back. So, uh, another potential future classic Chrysler Crossfire. Ah, that's the other American, which is really not an American. It's no, it's not an American car. That's why there is actually another American car, but this is actually a German car. Yeah, it's it's an interesting design. Um, you know, I think heavily influenced by the success of the Audi TT, um, and it's it's got that sort of armadillo tail on the back, and um, I don't think it's sold all of the all that well. No, it it's, did it's not. an SLK underneath. Um, there were some um, some high performance models that came later, the SRT6. Um, but it was still, it was automatic only, it was older underpinnings and all of that. So it, it didn't sell in huge numbers. And, and I remember you could, you could actually get one on uh, overstock.com. I don't know if you remember that little, yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah, little yeah. Dodge that they, 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 they were sitting around and they tried to do this novel thing and they actually sold them through overstock.com because they were, you know, 25, 30% off list. Um, 
but uh, it's I, I think it's a unique design that that some people really still gravitate toward. Um, I think that's got a better shot at being a future classic than than the Blackwood. With all due respect, I think that's <laughs> that's okay. The, the Blackwood to me is one of those. Um, because it's a curiosity, it's like saying the Murano Cross Cabriolet is going to be, you know, it's it's not not a particularly good vehicle, but because of the the, you know, the the uniqueness factor, the sort of. Uh, I'd have to. I, I I I hate to say this, but I'd have to say that about both of them because yeah. to me the, the the Chrysler Crossfire appealed to people who wanted to buy a Mercedes, not pay a Mercedes price. Yeah, and I think that's mostly who they sold it to. And as as Chris mentions. Older SLK underpinnings, uh, without the uh, the magic folding hardtop and uh, without a manual gearbox option, and you know, not a bad design in its day, but um, I think probably didn't age well. I, I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time seeing. Yeah, it. no, no. Hey, I'm throwing this out yeah. there just uh, hey, to create. I, I, a, I will a say they're, they're plenty affordable now. You could probably pick one up for six, seven grand. Yeah. Exactly. Sure, sure. In fact, higher mileage. I, I saw. I think one listed as low as two grand, but that oh. was probably a beaten. beaten. Yeah. Okay. And the last one I have on my list is uh, Cadillac ELR. And uh, one of the best looking General Motors designs in a really long time. Uh, just gorgeous proportions, beautiful interior. Um, but you know, it, its body was writing ca- checks that its you know it its drivetrain couldn't cash. Um, it's basically a Volt, uh, and they're, yeah. they're, they're frankly, they've, Volt with they've still been, body. it's a first-gen Volt, yeah. um, and, you know, hideously expensive, um, and I just... Uh, That's one of the major problems. Uh, th- this car is kind of a great example of of GM trying to find its way, because before the bankruptcy, um, there was a lot of talk about, well, shouldn't the Chevy Volt have been made a Cadillac first? because then you could charge a higher price and not lose so much money on it, given that this technology is so new and advanced that, uh, you know, you, it would take a while before the Chevy Volt could start breaking even, and it would, wouldn't take quite so long for the Cadillac. So, um, you know, maybe it should have been a Cadillac first. Well, no, uh, Rick Wagner wanted it to be a Chevy. I think probably in the end that turned out to be the right decision. The, the, the newer management have developed that car very well. To Chris's point, again, they um, the problem now with cadences, unlike in the era of this 1971 Cadillac Eldorado, uh, GM cannot afford to update everything in the lineup at the same time uh, that's related. So, so the Cadillac has older technology than the, the Chevy has for twenty or $30,000 less. It makes it a curiosity. They sold very few of them. Will it be a collector model? You know, the problem is they couldn't sell them at the sticker price when they were new. How much lower does it have to go before it starts coming back up again? I don't know. That's, yeah. that's you, you could buy, uh, I remember doing a story, you could buy an ATS Coupe and a Volt and be cheaper than the sticker on, on you know, the ELR. The ELR. Well, you know, the ELR started at 75 grand, and then it, it went nowhere, so they dropped the price 10 grand. Mm-hmm. And Boy, for anybody who bought one already, they, they must have felt screwed. Yeah. yeah. And now you can get them um, for, I would say, about 30 to 50,000. And I, I'd say you're still paying way too much, other than if you just want a beautiful design in your garage. A very handsome car, and by the way, makes me think that maybe the more and this may be too obvious, but the more collectible car, because we see a lot of them here in Detroit, but I don't think a relatively large number of them in Detroit, but I don't think I've seen one well. this year. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say the car I'm talking about, though, is the uh, is the Cadillac CTS Coupe. Mm-hmm. I think and that'll Wagon, be a collectible course. car. I think those two will yeah. be collectibles. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, if you drill down into a CTS V uh, Cooper wagon with a manual gearbox, then you're talking... Rarity. W- wonderful yeah. car, and half of them... You know, we're press pool cars. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, th- and that's what I tried to go for in picking these. And look, I, I just wanted to spark a discussion, right? Oh, in, in great Houston. discussion. But uh, my, my criteria have been, it's got to be relatively rare. You yeah. just don't see these things very much. They had to be interesting in a visual way and or in a technological way. And, uh, and they have to be uh, something that's sort of readily available right now but haven't caught on mm-hmm. yet. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to look at is, uh, 
And I, I, I love what you guys just said, that uh, CTSV wagon, especially the manual one, sure. very rare. I know uh, some of our other viewers wrote in, one of them said the Cadillac XLR, you yeah. know, which was essentially yeah. a rebodied uh, Corvette. Yeah. And, and people came in with all kinds of things from all over the map. But that's what I'm looking at. What, what, what's going to be on the lawn at a Concours in 30 or 40 years? I haven't, uh, I, I don't know what the values are now, but have you looked at values of the Cadillac Al uh, Alante? Uh, have they... That's a good question. Up, I mean, I, I think uh, they're probably. Uh, that's a very clean design, actually. Yeah. When you go back oh, and you look at it, that was Pinot Grino. Right, that, right. that had the world's longest assembly line. That was yeah. the, the nightmarish process where <laughs> they back and they forth, literally yeah. flew bodies back and forth. It yeah. was, it was in the middle of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in in special planes, utterly insane. But still, you know, a good-looking car, and the the later cars with the North Star, not you know, not a bad performing well, vehicle. So typical but GM, I, right? By the last year of production, yeah. it was perfect, so they yeah. killed it. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think the hot segment seems to be right now is early SUVs um, are, are picking up a lot of traction. Things like, like what? Or like early Forerunners, uh, three door Forerunners, three door Pathfinders, um, even you know some of the earlier stuff, the International Harvesters, uh, you know Scouts and stuff like that, and and workaday trucks like uh, Chevy CKs are, are going pretty well. Um, early eight, late seventies, early eighties, that okay. sort of thing, uh, and those you can still find for reasonable prices, and you know they're solid utilitarian designs. So you raise raise an interesting question. Does that mean that uh, as as mainstream buyers, as the the vast majority of people, migrate from Toyota Camrys and uh, you know uh, Ford um, Ford Fusions to uh, to crossover car based crossover mm -hmm. CUVs? Does that mean that there will be some sort of, you know, kind of uh, nostalgia and therefore collector interest in good old-fashioned truck-based SUVs? Good question. Yeah, and I also wonder about early crossovers when it gets down to it. I mean, I don't, I don't think things like, and this is further down the, the field, I, I don't see like a, you know, Pontiac Aztec being anything other than an ironic statement, <laughs> but uh, like an Infiniti FX45, um, you know, great sound, really interesting look. You know, first generation car, you get the orange leather and all that stuff. And the V8, um, I really like those cars. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe we'll start to see some nostalgia for that sort of thing. I'm guessing the Pontiac Aztec's going to be at that Concord de Lemons yeah. on, uh, <laughs> right. on Saturday. Yeah. Hey, we were speaking uh, so much about pickup trucks and changing topics slightly here. What do you guys make of this report that pickups are starting to catch on in China? And the numbers are still very small. Let me yeah. let me say that. But I want to say last month pickup sales were up like over thirty percent in a market that was up not nearly that much. Well, ten or twelve years ago in China, there there was no interest whatsoever in sports cars, and and so that's kind of come a long way in that, you know, you could sell Rolls Royces. You know, people wanted those. The, the rich people in China, obviously, and uh, but Ferrari, no, not really. And that has changed. Uh, sport utility vehicles were, it, it was all about the three box sedan right. until, I don't know, late in the last decade, I believe. And uh, my understanding of the Chinese market, at least. And now that has changed quite a bit, of course. Crossover SUVs are huge in, in China. Booming. Booming. And so, you know, are they just discovering new models slowly? And then when, when they find them, well, this is the latest thing? Well, I think for a a lot of the markets, because of the you know the spatial and pollution issues that they've got in some of the mega cities, they banned you know the sales of, of pickups sure. that are of that size. They had the little commercial runabouts, but that was it. Um, but then people started to bring them in on and gray market, gray market, and you know there were hundred thousand dollar, hundred fifty thousand dollar pickups. Um, I remember Ford saying that Raptor sales that went over there were surprisingly strong there and in the Middle East. And now Ford has announced that they're going to bring the next generation Raptor there officially, and, and that's going to be a six figure vehicle. Yeah, I got to believe it's over a hundred yeah. grand. So I, you, you've be. got the the rich people at the upper end, the taste makers, that are saying that this is cool. There's there's merit here, and then so that can't help but trickle down a little bit. Yeah, when, so, I, when I was at the Beijing show this year, there was a lot of, you know, sort of like Hummer knockoffs. Not, not copies, yeah. but I'm saying big, bold, muscular, gigantic SUV things. Right. And, you know, and then just down the aisle away, there was the Ford Raptor. So, yeah, I think this is another change in the Chinese market. Well, the Chinese market has, has mimicked uh, the U.S. market at least to the extent that uh, the Chinese... 
early on did not embrace the hatchback and preferred a three box sedan even 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 if they could only afford a small compact or subcompact so and and of course that's now changing a little bit in the US finally but you know they've they've kind of copied us or followed us more so than the the Japanese market or even the European market right to a certain extent and um, so maybe it's not that much of a surprise if there's any kind of interest in American culture if um, you know if they're watching Western movies on TV I don't know uh, maybe maybe that's part of it maybe that's part of the image yeah Hey, we got more topics to get to here, but uh, time for another quick commercial break. And Carmen, let's give a shout out to our friends at Borg Warner. And we're back. So speaking of, uh, you know, marketing SUVs and all that. What do you guys make of the story that Volkswagen is going to allow its U.S. marketing arm to name its next SUV? Because heretofore, every single one of its models have always been, the names of them have always been chosen in Germany. And kind of chosen by Ferdinand Piak, who's no longer there. I mean, he had this thing about, you know, the Tuareg people and um, a lot of a mi Middle Eastern vibe to the names. And I think a lot of this probably has to do with the fact that they are just completely stumbling in the U.S. market and have since the late 1970s, and that you know this is this is a very American kind of vehicle. I guess they're gonna. I think they're gonna sell it in China. I'm not sure if they've announced that or not. But oh, I'm sure they will. Hey, every, sure they will. Everybody better be thinking about selling SUVs right. and crossovers. Yeah. But, it's but not, I don't think it'll be in Europe. Too big. Too big. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it'll be there, but just not in big numbers. I mean, Mercedes and BMW and Audi all sell their full-size SUVs there. They just don't sell a lot of them. Sure. Although, but that's at a different price point, right? That's in the luxury segment where oh, people can point. absorb that and the fuel economy and all that. And don't so. forget, they're, they're, the European Passat is different from the American Passat. It's not as large still. They, mm -hmm. they still have two yeah. Passats or more. If Does a, a name make a difference? Can, can a name sell more cars? It, it always helps when people can pronounce the car name. So uh, Tiguan, which was a melding of tiger and iguana, there was some contest-winning horrible thing that came out. <laughs> tiger um, and iguana. That's, that's what it was, yeah. And um, that's, yeah, it's a little trivia question. Um, it sounds like I made it up, but it's actually no, true. No, it's true. I, it's um, and then, uh, you know, the Touareg, people can't spell, people can't look it up in search engines very easily. It's, it's ungainly. It, it, it reeks to me a little bit of, of desperation. Of, of this whole thing with the with diesel gate and that um, you know that we it, it, it's interesting if they come up with a really good catchy name think about it think about how um, luxury car brands both American and foreign talk explain the reason why we've got a Cadillac CT6 and not a Cadillac uh, um, Fleetwood um, Brougham or, or or DeVille or something like that is because uh, Cadillac wants people to think of the car as a Cadillac, not as the model. Well, if you have a, um, uh, if you have a, w whatever they end up calling uh, the Volkswagen, the uh, monkey bar, Volks mo the Volkswagen monkey bar, people like, like monkey bar and say, I'm going out to buy a monkey bar, not a Volkswagen, <laughs> and monkey bar won't be associated with uh, TDIs. Yeah, could be. I, th I think it's an overdue change. Uh, you know, it's it's. It'll, it'll be simple, and it fits the form of all these other vehicles. You know, it'll probably be named after, you know, some rugged town somewhere in North America or the world, and it'll be easier to, to pronounce, and it'll fit more in with the landscape of people that buy these types of vehicles. Is it a big deal? Probably not, but uh, it's, I think it's an important win for, for Volkswagen. Oh, you're right. You look at, you look at Hyundai or, or Kia, Hyundai, you know, Santa Fe, and uh, all these Western Tucson, towns. Tucson, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think... A car name doesn't matter entirely, but when you get the right name for the right car, bang, does it yeah. work. Mm -hmm. So Mustang, Corvette, sure. Charger, I mean, uh, that all works. Or here we've got Eldorado. Yeah. I mean, yeah. those kinds of names, I think, really work with the car, but I don't well, know if that it's going to move. Western towns, I guess. Yeah. That, uh... <laughs> 
hot springs or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Another topic I wanted to ask you guys about, uh, Chrysler or FCA confirming they're no longer going to build passenger cars in the United States. They'll make them in Mexico, maybe. They'll make them in Canada for the time being uh, and elsewhere in the FCA empire, but not here. What do you think about that? All the eggs in one basket. Yeah. Well, yes. And, and I.e. I, I, meaning they're only going to build uh, trucks and SUVs here and right. all that. And what if that market gets hit? Yeah, and it, I mean, it's an eventual concern, but frankly, they haven't proven to be very adept at, at building and selling cars at a profit. Um, you know, the ones that are that well regarded. I mean, the, the, you know, the 300 and Charger, they've been around for a long time and they're based on old Mercedes underpinnings. They're, they're, they're nice vehicles in their own right, but go smaller and they've struggled with everything. I mean, the Dart is frankly a not very good vehicle. Um, and I don't think the Fiats are selling particularly well. They don't make any money, so. Well, and, and that's the thing. They, they have no margin, and this is really part of a bigger trend, I think. If you look at the German manufacturers, uh, most of them will continue to build, their, German or any European manufacturer, including the Italians, will continue to build their um, premium or higher profit cars and their trucks uh, SUVs in in Germany or in Italy, in the case of Alfa Romeo, uh, but then uh, the Fiat, the Volkswagens, uh, some of the Opals are made in Czech Republic or Poland or other parts of the um, new parts of the EU where the the costs are much lower. And the same thing here. You want to be building, I think, your your passenger cars, your compact, subcompact, maybe midsize sedans in Mexico. And you build your SUVs where even if they're a mainstream SUV, a Chevy or a Ford or a Dodge in the United States, you still have a bigger margin on that SUV versus the, the compact car. And then you also build your luxury brands here. You build your Cadillacs, your Lincolns, and so on here. Save on shipping. <laughs> but, but it's, yeah. you know, as long as there's a NAFTA, which, yeah. you know, who ahead. knows, come November, next January, uh, you know, as long as there's a NAFTA, it makes a lot of sense to have your thin profit margin cars get a little bit more of a profit margin by building them in Mexico. Uh, I, you know, I can't fault them for that, frankly. No, you can't. And, and you know, well, Mexico lug, lug, is our Eastern Europe, so to speak. Exactly. Or Eastern Europe is there in Mexico. Much, very much so. Very much so. And, and, you know, luxury cars, bigger profit margins make them here. Hmm. And you, what do you guys think about uh, this? fake sales reporting, you know, that the FCA lied about their sales. Well, it shows the intense pressure that everyone is under to, to continue that sales streak. When it was something like, what is it, 75 months or something? Yeah. And then they had to roll back, you know, a couple of years worth. Um, but they said through their own forensic accounting that they actually may have underreported numbers. It was just over some months and under some other months. But overall, like, I think they think they sold 19,000 more vehicles or something like that. Than, yeah, yeah. You know. to me it was such a minor discrepancy. Yeah. You wouldn't seem to need to do it if you consider how low its sales, how low Chrysler's sales <laughs> were in 09 and 10. I mean, they were really scraping the bottom, so anything would be up. And um, it, uh, it also reminds me a little bit, wasn't there some BMW reporting a couple of years ago where they were pulling some sales uh, from the, the next model, uh, the next calendar year in January into December to try to beat... Uh, I, Mercedes I, yeah, no, no, There's that, that was last December. It was last December. It seemed like yeah. forever ago. Now. Well, you know, everybody plays with numbers. You I know. shouldn't say everybody, but we know that certain companies have played with the numbers. But yeah, uh, what BMW got caught doing was telling dealers to buy a whole bunch of demo right. cars. Right. And if you looked at last December, sales of the i3 and the i8, boom, <laughs> they did really well yeah. for the, for what they are. Right. And then they paid the price for it. Because, this is not you know, to excuse Fiat Chrysler. No, 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 no. no. No, not because, yeah, you know, they've been bragging, hey, 47 consecutive months of increasing sales. Well, yeah. now we know, no, that the sales streak ended some time ago. Yeah. And now they're getting investigated because could that have had a material impact on the price of their stock? Mm -hmm. That people think, sure. oh, they got all this momentum and they keep getting better and better. So I'm going to invest in the company, whereas if the truth had been known... They were still doing fantastic, but they couldn't claim 47 consecutive months. I think it was like 41 consecutive months or whatever. I hate to say this, but is this, is, will this prove Elon Musk right that you should just throw out a global number every three or four months or so, or what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wonder if there's not some 
some numbers tweaking at, at Tesla too. I mean, oh. we keep seeing uh, stories on, on in forums where they're finding you know uh, parking garages full of brand new Model S's and even uh, Model X's that, that sure. are just sitting around and they're collecting dust and you know it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Hey, we've got some questions coming in here. Uh, so our work wants to know. Do the plastic fascias on the Crossfire and others make them unappealing as collector items? Everything's got a plastic fascia. I mean, yeah. so many cars yeah. do. I, I, I think as Ray was telling us, this is the last all-steel car Cadillac made. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it has no plastic on it, or certainly not on any of the body parts. And, and this is a 71, so... Yeah. Everything's had plastic since the early 70s. The question is going to be uh, when the judges at Pebble Beach 40 years from now look at these cars, will they take points off for not having the right uh, software update to their in <laughs> info, <laughs> info nav system? But that's a good question. Like, you're, you're a month out of date here. You're, you're a month ahead. That's not correct. So we have to backdate you for that. Yeah. yeah. Our work makes another good point. He says a problem with the ELR, you know, which I selected as a potential classic. He says it's the battery. A gas car can sit in the garage with an empty tank, but can be used with, a f with fresh gas. A battery car has to be used to keep it useful, and down the road is to totally dependent on the usability of the battery. Uh, great he mentions that, because that's actually going to be a problem, is that when you get a new battery for your ELR 10 or 20 years from now, you're not going to get the original battery, or it, it won't be exactly... The same. Oh, it would be a fraction of the size and, you know, a fraction well, of the weight. Well, they, they have to build, uh, they, they have to build the, the original battery pack, basically, for 10 years right. as replacements. And because they're batteries, they couldn't build up a bunch of them when the car came out and then just store them. Uh, I, I was just, I just had a tour of the uh, Brownstown Township uh, factory, and this came up. And uh, so, yes, they, 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 they will build a new battery for your ELR, say, five years from now or ten years from now, and will it be exactly the same? As, you know, any kind of upgrade that they've made to it since then, which I guess won't be much since this is the last of that battery pack, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same. I, I wonder if it'll be catastrophically expensive because people won't be building batteries of that type or size at that point, or if because the technology's moved on so much that the cost has gone down and well, GM says it has to do that cost. for 10 years. That's part of, right. you know, yeah. the, the FMVSS. But we're, we're talking about 20, 30 well, years 20, 30 from now. Years yeah. from now right? sure. No, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. You know, like with all the electronics, uh, who's going to be making the chipsets mm -hmm. for your iDrive in your BMW in 20 years? Nobody is. No, right. ch chances are, you know, there'll be some kid like my son with a Raspberry Pi little computer yeah. with an emulator that you just stick under the dashboard and you connect, you know, one, one connection and all basically just emulates everything. On the other hand, you've got uh, 3D printing, so maybe that'll help. <laughs> yeah. Have, have your part 3D printed. Okay, Sam wrote in to uh, give us some information on the Subaru SVX. He said it was sold from uh, 1992 through 1996. Wow, that late. Had a 3.3 liter mm -hmm. flat boxer engine. Yeah. He says, one of the most enjoyable cars of the day, I thought. Hmm. I remember driving it. It, it was cool. Mm -hmm. It was cool, but... You know, I, I, there was one in the press fleet. I got to drive it, and I don't think I've ever seen another one on the road ever since. Oh, yeah, I, I see them every once in a while. But the, the, uh, the thing is, it, it predated in large measure the idea of all-wheel drive luxury, right? I mean, Audi was still doing it, you know, pretty consistently, but not everybody else had really made it a cornerstone of their brand, which is something in a two-door right? coupe. Yeah. So Michael Ma from San Francisco wrote in to say, the Internet is still buzzing about GM building a mid-engine car for 2019 to 2020. Will this new car be a Zora or a Cadillac? And, or do you guys even believe they're going to do a mid-engine sports car? I think, I think there's, yeah, I think the writing is on the wall. I, I've just heard too much rumblings um, from various sources that that's going to happen. And, and I think it'll be a Corvette. I think it'll, it might be called the Corvette Zora, but I'm not sure they're going to do two Corvettes. I think maybe... GM has decided, for better or worse, that that's the future direction of the car, that they've done everything they can with, with the Corvette in its traditional configuration, that the next thing is, how do we really nail down the handling? And, and See, I, want, I, I think there could be two Corvettes 
for, for two reasons. Number I think one, there should. We, we had Taj Juchter in here when the current gen, the C7, came out. Mm -hmm. And we asked him out mid engine. He says, I hear all about this. There's the rumors are all over the web. He says, I'm here to tell you unequivocally there is no such program. He says, none that I know. And he says, I think I ought to know if there is such a program. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was vehement about it, not going to do yeah, it. Yeah. But then you look at the Ford GT. And they're not going to make a whole lot of them. Right. It's essentially a hand-built car. It's, it's mid-engine. I mean, come on. Isn't that the way to do it if you're going to compete against them? I agree. I've written about how they should almost make that a sub-brand and sell them in both Chevrolet and Cadillac dealerships and that they should maintain the traditional Corvette uh, as a front-engine rear-wheel drive car that would be affordable would be a, a cheaper alternative to a Porsche 911 as, as it's always been uh, and then also do a higher end uh, mid-engine car which actually could just be a, a Cadillac if they so choose chose but I'm, I'm hearing else uh, I'm hearing otherwise and I, I may have some misinformation or disinformation or I, disinformation yeah I, I think I think you're right though I think it's gonna stay Corvette I think there is going to be a mid-engine car um, I think and I hope that they keep the two-tier thing going um, because I think one of the great things about the, the Corvette for a long time is its everyday usability, you know, real trunk and all, and all of that, um, which it's, it's a weird thing to talk about, but you talk to Corvette owners, longtime Corvette owners, and they brag about how much stuff they can fit in or how great their gas mileage sure. is and their visibility and all of that, and you just won't get that in a mid-engine car. But I think you're right. I mean, there's, there's so much action now in the $150,000, $200,000 price point and up they can't build enough of a, a lot of these types of cars. So there's, there's a market for that. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, if, if the performance is there, they could, they could probably sell both. And, and frankly, we've already seen a lot of those grainy, very long-distance spy shots. Yeah. And granted, they're all camouflaged, but when you look at the back end, doesn't say Cadillac, the lights say Corvette. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be their mule, too. Could, right? could absolutely. Could it it's just hard be, to judge those cars yeah. or, you know, extrapolate from sure, them. Sure. Well, and the thing is, if you're talking about a two-tiered Corvette, so to speak, yes, I, I think there almost by necessity will be some sort of overlap. Um, but whether that's more than a year or not, think about the entire sports car market. Sure, you know, Porsche is doing well, but Porsche is doing well selling more uh, Cayennes and Panameras than their sports cars. Um, you know, the, the Miata and the, the Spiata come along and they sell well for, for the first year, but then settle down to a pretty small number at a much lower price point. Um, you know, there's some sports cars, the high ends, the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis uh, will be around, but things are changing a lot. Uh, the, 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 the future of the auto market will be a lot different. There's a lot, a lot more car sharing is what we're looking to next. Uh, a... Uh, autonomy that will eventually kill off the stick shift. Uh, you know, maybe there won't be so much room for um, sports cars that are somewhere between um, mainstream Miatas and Fiatas and the high-end cars. And, and then you've got to talk about cafe and all those other things. So maybe there, eventually there will be room for just one and it'll be that higher end, uh, more expensive car. And I'm intrigued by what you're saying. Sell it in Cadillac and Chevy dealers. I think that's what they should have done. Uh, I think, uh, or that's what they should be planning to do. I, I don't know that they'll end up doing that. But if they made, if they separated Corvette as a brand to a certain extent, think about, this is not a really good comparison, but think about Scion where you have a little bit of a separate dealership. And you already have, obviously, some Chevrolet dealers are more have a reputation where they sell lots of Corvettes and they're selling to a much different, well, to, a lot of the cars are going to a different clientele than your average Malibus and Cruises or, or Silverados. And, um, and then you think about the fact that the very few Corvettes, and, the very few Corvettes that they sell in Europe are sold through the Cadillac dealers mm -hmm. in Europe. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. Good to point. Just make Good point. Extent. Uh, we got a question from A.M. Guerrero in Manila in the Philippines. But, but we should have kept Ray here because he's asking, what's it like driving an Eldorado with this massive amount of torque with an 8.2 liter V8 in front of the front wheels? And, you know, this is still the early days of uh, front wheel drive. Yeah. I mean, you know, compared to where we're sitting right now, that's right. the early days. So uh, 
I'm sorry, A.M. Guerrero. We, 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 we should have had uh, Ray for that question. And then one last uh, comment here. Wes Ride uh, sent this in via Twitter. He says, our friends at Fast Lane Daily have been let go. I love their content as well as yours. It was a sad day in car news. Yeah, and I, I, I hadn't heard that. that yeah, I saw an item on Twitter, I think, about Time. Uh, they're owned by Time. That re uh, recently, they were purchased by Time along with The Drive. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they've been around for, I think, you know, something like eight, nine years. Yeah, and they've been around really, a really long time, um, really early into the daily news updates on YouTube for yeah. the Autosphere. Um, always sad to see colleagues, uh, you know, go without, and I think they had a loyal audience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a shame. They said, you know, it's not being canceled permanently, that, that it's on indefinite hiatus. It doesn't sound so great, but maybe somebody will pick them up and, and resuscitate it. I, I don't honestly know. Um, but it, I, you, you have to wonder if, if time bought, um, you know, drive the, the video platform with the intention of holding on to that and, and developing that and then just kind of pushing that fast lane daily off to the side quickly. Don't know. Nope, don't know either, but hope those guys land someplace because they, they did do a good job. Hey, we're going to have to wrap it up, but I uh, want to thank you both. Chris Pockert. Great to be here. Thanks. CNET, Todd Lassa, Automobile. Great having the both of you guys here. Thanks, John. And, uh, and special thanks to Ray and his 71 El Dorado. And of course, got to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, feel good about driving. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. So good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. No, good topics. And uh, now I get you guys to look at this. Had a lot of good things to talk about. Drink it in. That's uh, well, that's a lot of car, yeah. Uh, you know I, what I like is this uh, sort of fake grill right behind uh, yeah. the door there on uh, the leading oh, edge of the rear yeah. fender. Yeah. You know, just a, a, it's just there for pure fake, styling. Yeah. I referenced something from the 30s to Ray's point, I think. There was maybe, maybe not. Maybe, I'm not maybe sure. Like an Auburn or... Hmm. I wonder, I we, we've... We've been, uh, we've always been seeing it on like these future car things. That if spats will ever come back because of just because of aero. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, I thought they would, and in fact, if you remember, uh, Ford did a series of aerodynamic studies that they called Probe. It was mm -hmm. the, the Probe yep. one, two, three, yep. and I think it was up to the four. They even had spats on the front mm -hmm. wheels mm. that would. I'm trying to remember how it worked, if it was like a, a flexible membrane or something that pulled out, you know, because when you turn yeah. the front wheels, right. you know, you're going to impinge on those things. And they, they had some mechanism for allowing you to turn, but, but kept that for arrow reasons. Which sounds very complicated. It does. Right? Yeah, way too complicated. Or just, you have a really, really narrow track. Just the oh, I, yeah. I think it was the same car. Remember, you know, in aerodynamics, the... the uh, the air flows over the body, and when you get to the back end, you know, you, want, you get all this turbulence, yeah. and you want to keep uh, the airflow attached to the sides as much as possible. So, and I think it was the probe four. They literally had uh, vents on the side, but at the rear of the car mm -hmm. that would suck air in and then vent it out the very back of the car. So sucking it in helped maintain attached flow mm -hmm. and venting it out the rear sort of tricked the airflow into thinking you had sort of like a combock hmm. design to it. Wow. And they, they picked up quite a few counts of arrow that way. But again, very complicated. Yeah. You gotta run all these fans all the time. Well, the, the probe, the first gen probe in 89, the first year it came out, that was the most aerodynamic production car that year. Hmm. The GL had a, had a oh. .29 CD. Wow. Uh, I, so I, I guess the, 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 the answer to your question might come from a study of how much more, how much better arrow do you get with uh, spats, at least in the back, versus mm -hmm. uh, perfectly flat mm -hmm. um, wheels. 
Well, the in, and they they ran out the Insight like that. The first gen Insight had little spats and yeah. Was that the last car with production car in North America with spats on it? Which one? The Insight, the first gen Insight. Oh, the, the little two seater. Yeah. Uh, at least of any yeah. any volume. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. But on this car, it was not done for aero. No. It, it was done style. purely for styling, and yeah. it just makes the car look that much longer because you're not really interrupting, you know, look, the flow. Look at the how low with. Look at the overhang in the back. It's I know, like. It's you, you only see that on like a you know, 18 passenger van today, you know? <laughs> right. But it's great. We had, we had growing up, we didn't have Cadillacs, we had Oldsmobiles, but you know, my dad bought at least three in a row big two door hardtops. We, you know, my sister and I, so we didn't have any other kids, any siblings, so welcome yeah. back. So, so Ray, and I'll ask you now. Didn't pick out my favorite part of the, the car. No kidding. Yeah. This, this oh, great. That. It's gorgeous. Because once yeah. you get into 73, they'd slap the molding back on here and then take uh, it away from the end. Huh. It's been completely uh, interrupted the whole yeah. I, I love just like the huge expanses of uninterrupted sheet metal like that. You know, it's just <clears throat> So what what is it like driving this car? You know, oh, I from, love it. it doesn't yeah. feel like it looks. It doesn't yeah. feel long at all. But, but do you get torque steer and all that or not? If you get if you get into the gas, you'll get torque steer. Okay, you um, do get some. Yeah, but not anything like what you do out of a, a modern, uh, a more modern front wheel drive car. Mm -hmm. It's not as bad today as it was, you know, maybe ten years ago or, or more. You get a lot of squats so that if you do stomp on it from a stoplight. Uh, the front ends, get light. front tires get well, light, and they're I'll, just. I'll rip those tires right off the car. Yeah. <laughs> they will unstoppably not stop. Yeah. 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 So, it was... uh, we're still live, but we're yeah. gonna just you can keep talking, but we're gonna pull the car while we're live, just so you all know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ray didn't have his uh, mic on, so maybe just, he, oh. he should. Yeah. He should off. answer that about the. What, what it's Here, like yeah, to just drive. Just clip that mic still, right on. We're kind of in a post-show mode. We're in the okay. post-show yeah. mode, but okay. people still watch. The gentleman who asked the question yeah. about so, what so it's like to drive. What's it like so. to drive? What, what, what's the torque steer and all that like? The torque steer's not bad at all when it's uh, when you're you know driving like anybody normal. If you're heavier in the gas, it may it may pull a little bit. Uh, being that I still have the original style tires on it, the the bias ply. Will drag, you know. If you if you are in a crease, it's still going to pull you one way or the other. But I wouldn't change that for the world because that is the way the car was. Yeah. Um, but all in all, when you're driving, you do not feel as your car is 20 feet long. Uh, <laughs> it it actually feels very personal, and that's why it was a personal luxury car. Uh, you didn't feel that that coupe that Coupe de Ville feel where you felt like you're on cloud nine and could drive it for 16 days and never have a sore. <laughs> uh, but to me, it's very, very personal. And you've, you've got the it, the light steering, and it's, it, how are the brakes? Uh, they, they stop pretty well. Yeah. I mean, you have discs up front at least, yes. right? Yeah. Yep. So, um, Like my 67 Eldorado uh, that I previously sold, that was, I think, the first year that they offered the the front-wheel disc GM, brakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that car also uh, drove phenomenal. Sad to get rid of it when I did. You know, uh, I, I got a regret that the boulevard ride that is so dur you know it, it it'll come put back put down by it'll, the it'll come back the you know it the enthusiast it, it, media it, 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 it'll come back because when autonomy takes over yeah. it doesn't matter yeah it, steering feel doesn't matter you know the the firmness of the brake pedal none of it matters it's just how comfortable is my couch well and modern suspensions now you you can have that balance sure. of ride and handling, and and of course the downside to the pillow soft ride was the first turn. You really had to slow yeah. down quite a bit, otherwise you're just gonna nose yeah. dive into it. Right, but you know I would argue that for 90 percent of the car buying public, mm -hmm. the Boulevard ride is really Absolutely. what they want. Oh, there, there are too many, way too many sport packages on vanilla cars like uh, you know the midsize. Um, Midsize front drive sedans, Camry where SE they or just whatever, go yeah. way overboard on uh, on on the handle, trying to make it handle, and it's kind of like, eh, what difference does well, it make? Everything else is switch related now, so yeah. I don't see why you can't There's turn that a too. switch to put you right on cloud nine. Yeah. Great, uh, great, can, great point. But yeah. I, I want to say the only thing that even comes close that I've experienced recently is on the Lincoln MKZ. The, you can go into on uh, on the screen, and there's multiple suspension settings, and you can go for the loosest, loosest one possible, and that's getting close to it. 
But the boulevard ride was that floating feel. Yeah. It wasn't just soft. <laughs> it just sort of floated. Yeah. And these days, with so many roads around the country, here in Michigan especially, being in such poor condition, it's even more reason to have that boulevard ride. I think a lot of it, too, though, was... Here, we, hold that up to you oh, so they can hear you. We were in a fight to compare ourselves with the European ride with BMW and Audi, uh, with the younger crowd buying a more expensive car, they wanted to feel the road, mm-hmm. whereas the, the older people don't want to feel the right. road and they still own the pocketbook. Well, and, uh, and there's more of a need for that over in Europe when you have higher speeds on the Autobahn and you've got twisty roads. roads. Yeah, yep. right. you need that. Well, and you're, you're exactly right. And just to get back to that 8.2 liter badge on the car, this is kind of the nascent period of Cadillac already seeing that, hey, look, people are buying more Mercedes in the States. Uh, there's this brand called BMW. They mostly make the, the little uh, compact uh, two-door. But, uh, you know, we're seeing more, we're seeing these foreign guys encroach into our area. And then, you know, a few years later, you had the Seville, uh, which had the 5.7 liter V8 and was supposed to be uh, very much a European sports sedan mm-hmm. type of thing. And the Lincoln Versailles. And, yeah, I mean, it was just a few years away. And then, you know, you know, you we remember those years, John, where you know between that and OPEC and the big bumpers and the federal regulations, um, and the the regs, what, what it did with bumpers and so on was really take these bodies to your point, and when they were when they were updated, you know, get rid of some of those nice styling touches, and they became right. kind of blocky and. Right, that's, fat and heavy. Yep. Yeah, that's why I like some of the resto mods where they're just doing really subtle tweaks and they're just tucking the bumpers back in, or they're removing the overriders and all that. It happened to the you know the British sports cars too. Like, you know, look at the TR8. You know, mm-hmm. or just sure. these massive rubber bumpers. They just look awful. Sure, it's like I, I was in before. When I was earlier days, I liked the hot rods and the in in the very clean line, uh, uh, new designs. And uh, there was. Uh, I, I imagine the cars I love, which was these cars, because they were embedded in me, uh, what I would do to, to change them. And I, I remember looking at cars and dragging in the bumpers or eliminating them and just putting little details in there would make the body look phenomenal. This one, I came up to blank. I, I really had nothing to do. I wish I could get rid of the license plate pocket in the front. That's about <laughs> the only thing that I would love to get rid of. But other than that, I think this body is one of the cleanest that they have ever had uh, for a very long span of time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, so thank you guys for having me. Yeah, no, thanks for coming over and especially bringing the car in here. This is, it's always good to have a car in I, I, I love the hood. Not just the size of it, but, the, you know, you don't notice it from the side, but how much the, they're peaked, you know, when you look at it from a, yeah. a plan view overhead right. or, you know, when you see it dead on. Because here it just looks almost monolithic, but but you look at it, there's so much depth in there. That's cut in. It's great, right? So Ray, that that front uh, yeah, license plate pocket is built into the bumper. It's not detachable. No, no, because I think in the '70s that you had to have a front and rear. Yeah, I think license. every state well, it mm-hmm. depended every state on the state. That. Well, yeah. but most of them did. I, yeah. There were a most couple of them still of exceptions. do. Now, if you could most eliminate that, that would all together look. Oh, it would look a million times better. It yeah. really would. Yeah. You thin out the uh, the 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 bumpers in the center there a little yeah. bit more. And I think it would all together thin it out even. I bet you Chip Foose could do that for you if you had a, a, some spare change. I'd take a run at it first before I give it up to somebody else. Right. But Hold on to the original as is. Find a spare to, right. to monkey with. Well, John and Chris know that my wife and I just got ourselves a 1960 Austin Healey Bug Eye Sprite Mark I. And uh, we got it from, uh, from bugeyeguy.com in Connecticut, a guy who specializes in mm-hmm. the cars. And um, he said, so do you want the front bumper on or off? We said off. And uh, that was an option or yeah. it might have been uh, required, at least in some states, in mm-hmm. 1960. And it really transforms the front end of the car. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, it cleans the, it up so much. Yeah, and at yeah. this point... You know, if you're in an accident, it, it oh, doesn't matter. Believe anyway, me, right? believe me. It's, it's all no offense, but it's all over. Oh, no believe what. me, I understand. I mean, it, it might barely match up with the bumper on our Miata, but mm-hmm. not much else. And besides, those bumpers were just you know yeah. thin chrome ribbons. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. it, it no might substance. have protected you a little bit in parking. 
not you, but the person backing up to your car going, oh, I hit it. Oh, there's a, there's a. There it is. Yeah. Ours has the original steel wheels, but uh, it's the same color. Yeah. We have iris blue, hmm. which is fairly unusual for that car. It looks like this one. Is that right-hand drive? I can't tell. Anyway. Left-hand drive. Left-hand drive. Left -hand yeah. drive. From here, it looks like right-hand yeah. drive. So, yep. Very cool. Yeah. No, I can't wait to see your car. So, well, yeah, I'll be happy to bring it in sometime. It'll fit. Oh, yeah. It will fit. We'll bring five the of them in here. I think it's about the length of the hood, Ray. It's Skittles. Yeah. You can bring in a whole rainbow of colors. Just yeah. so. My boss has a, uh, uh, Brian Joseph has a uh, smart car, and it's funny when he's parked next to me because it's literally within mm -hmm. the front, oh, I believe front windshield to the front of that fender. Yeah. <laughs> You're having way more fun than he is. Yeah, yes, I am. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. We, we need to let you out so uh, the crew can break down here. Thanks for bringing Thank it you in. again. Yeah, great. Great talking Th to you This guys. is great, man. Never watched yeah, the show, show before, but I will from now on. Cool. Thank you, guys. turn signal indicators. Oh, yeah. So you don't go driving down the road with your blinker on. This is going to remind you. Plus, it runs well with the line of defense. Yeah. When it's 73, I really bulky and fat. Huh. I had a 73. I had a 73. It only had 12,000 miles, too. It was triple white. It's great that the plate matches the car. Oh, my God. It is no. great, yes. It that is, is, that's, yeah. like, that's really nice. It's like a custom plate. Yeah. Did you, it is. I, it's an original plate, plate but my dad had <laughs> every one of his cars a place match the car. So I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore, but I think I'm underneath that. Uh, you know, I'll bet this chrome piece, it's got to weigh 20 pounds, right? Yeah. It's, it's heavy. This whole rear bumper assembly is incredibly heavy. Yeah, so you had, you had this pretty much apart to redo it. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. dude, I, I took you, you, unless you take this car, strip that top, no way you're going to find anywhere of original paint. Or, or on you don't need a golf club diagram in this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, the modern cars like small, small trunks, they're like, yeah. you can put a golf bag in here, but you have to wedge it in this way. That's right. You, know, you can take a golf cl club in your uh, man your caddy. You can throw yeah. it, you can throw it a, few, yeah. a few caddies and... But this, is a, this is a good guy's car. You can put three or four bodies yeah, in yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, thank you very yeah, much. Thanks, thank you. Anyway.